Welcome to lecture 23 of Biology 115 entitled Animal Behavior. In the next couple of lectures, we're actually going to be shifting into a new direction of general biology. Previously, we've been looking at many different evolutionary lectures, lectures based on the idea of Darwin and his evolutionary mechanism known as natural selection and how those things play out on the micro, macro, and phylogenetic scales. Now we're going to shift gears and actually start looking at some ecology, which is a whole other branch of biology, but still utilizes a lot of the evolutionary components that we've learned prior. The first lecture in this ecology series of lectures is animal behavior, and we'll begin this lecture by entitling our first flowchart, Introduction. So, now that we are beginning our discussion on animal ecology and ecology as a whole, we have to understand first one of the most interesting things, I think, about ecology, which is animal behavior. It's something very visible to us. It's something that we see every single day, and it's something that has an evolutionary purpose to it. What I mean by this is that if we look at behavior as a whole, and when we think of behavior, we just think of actions, right? Behavior is simply an action. And animals complete actions. This is not news to you or me. But these actions are specifically going to be rooted on muscular action, possibly. You know, muscles completing a certain action, let's say running. And then it also will utilize things like the nervous system, the brain telling the muscles to do something and complete a behavior. This means that there is certainly some sort of genetic component. There are genes that code for certain proteins that make up certain muscles. There are genes that code for certain cells to create the nervous system, all of which are going to combine in an effortless and seamless orientation to give us a behavior. We can define a behavior simply from an evolutionary standpoint and say that a behavior is a set of adaptations. And this is a new way, possibly, of thinking of behavior that you might have never thought of. But now that you have an understanding of evolution, it makes total sense because a behavior is essentially the same thing. It's equal to a phenotype. It's a physical representation of something that's genotypically ingrained in an individual. And we're going to see much of that, this innate idea of behavior, that you are born with behavior, and see how it certainly has a genotypic, and eventually we see the phenotypic physical manifestation of behavior in animals. And because it's a set of adaptations, we can immediately say that behavior in and of itself must be a product of natural selection. Natural selection doesn't just act on, let's say, fast, strong legs. It doesn't just act on real physical components. It actually acts on behavior as well, and we're going to see why and how. The main idea to understand about all of this is that behavior is just as much an evolutionary component to animals and biology as anything else, as eyesight is, as the ability to run is, as the ability to walk is. All of this is there for a reason, and the reason is to always maximize an animal's fitness. And when we maximize fitness, we create the greatest ability to produce viable and fertile offspring and that's what we mean by maximization of fitness utilizing good adaptive uh, product of natural selection behaviors so behaviors are a very powerful way of looking at the ways animals act and we're going to be seeing that through the scope of two things whenever you look at behavior you have to ask yourself what I would consider two basic questions there are always two basic questions every ecologist every animal behavioral ecologist has to ask themselves and wonder why the behavior is at the way that we see it so there are two basic questions to understand and these are going to give us a great idea of what behavior is all about first and foremost we have to understand how how is our first question what I mean by how is we have to understand the basis of behavior. How does that behavior, let's say, how does it occur? How does it occur? How does it actually show itself up in nature? That's a simple question. 
We can also ask a question such as, what say things change in behavior? Things change, right? Natural selection causes change. Adaptations are changes. Well then, how is this behavior modified? Is it modified? And is it, if it is, how is it modified? So how is it modified? When we say it, I just mean behavior. In addition, we have to ask ourselves um, about the environment. What are the environmental stimuli, let's say, that cause the behavior? What are the environmental stimuli that causes this occurrence, this modification? All based off of our how overarching question. We can even ask ourselves, well, let's say there are environmental stimuli. We know that modification may happen, but how does the organism itself, how does organism, O-R-G, respond? How does the organism physically respond? What type of physiological mechanisms does it have? to respond to a certain environmental stimuli and how will that manifest itself in modification and occurrence of behavior. And of course, finally, how does this behavior influence behavior as a whole? How does it influence behavior? Meaning that, is it good? Is it bad? Uh, why is it seen? Um, not why is it seen, but how is it seen? And what are the overarching sort of how questions that are going to be answered when we observe a behavior? So this is the main idea between about the how question. That's part one of our two basic questions. You always ask how behavior happens. This is called proximate causation. This is what uh, animal behaviorists would call proximate causation. What are the proximate causes of an animal's behavior? That means, how does the behavior occur? Contrastingly, we have another very important question to ask, and that is why. How and why are the two basic questions. Why predicates itself on the following why questions. We can ask ourselves, why does this behavior, so why does, well, I'll just say it, aid, and this is going to be our idea of evolution coming up, uh, why does it aid survival? and with survival always comes plus repro. Why does this behavior, however it occurs, why does it aid survival and reproduction? There's gotta be a reason. We try to figure that out when we observe behavior. And there's another why question that we ask ourselves, and that is, why is this related? Why is this, this as in this behavior, why is this related to evo, evolutionary history? There's got to be a reason why evolution has acted on this behavior in the way that it has, why and how, and where does it come from. Essentially, all of these questions that we have here, these are not proximate causation questions. We call these ultimate causation questions. And that, I think that's a really good way of thinking of it because these really are ultimate reasons as to why something is happening. Ultimate, let me rewrite that, I spelled it wrong. Ultimate causation. Simply speaking, what is the ultimate reason? What is the ultimate survival, repro, and evolutionary history reason for the behavior itself? Um, a good way to close off this introduction is to always look in the animal world and see a major example of proximate and ultimate causes to behavior. And we're going to look at our example very briefly. Uh, and our example will be the bluegill sunfish. So this is a fish, bluegill sunfish and it has a certain behavior and we're going to observe that behavior and that behavior that we observe is the fact that bluegill sunfish and I'll actually write this up here bluegill sunfish breed in spring that is a clear behavior that we know that we know for a fact happens why and how how and why so let's ask ourselves what are the proximate causes of this and when I say proximate, you immediately start thinking what? You immediately start thinking, how does this behavior occur? How does it occur? How is it modified? What are the environmental stimuli, et cetera? All of these how proximate questions. And we can answer that because the, the how is it modified or what are the environmental stimuli? I can answer that question right now and tell you that the environmental stimuli is an increase, and an increase is denoted by this arrow increasing, increase in day length. So that's when they breed. They breed in an increased day length. We don't know why yet, but we just know that that's an environmental stimulus that causes this proximately. And this, in turn, is going to have a response. The organism is going to have a response, and that response will be that the organism will trigger what we call photoreceptors, things that detect light. Photoreceptors are going to be stimulated if the daylight has increased. That means the photoreceptors are stimulated um, longer, we'll say. Stimulated longer. 
And if they're stimulated longer, then that's due to our increased day length, all proximate causes right now. And this is going to proximately cause, how does it influence behavior? Well, it influences behavior because we get neural and hormonal changes, all because of the increased day length which causes the photoreceptors to stimulate longer, which relayed back to the brain to cause neural and hormonal changes. These are how mechanisms, proximate causes. Let's look at the evolutionary mechanisms. Let's look at the evolutionary ultimate causes. The why. Why does this behavior happen? So ultimate causes. And we'll conclude on this. Well, the bluegill sunfish breeds in spring because of the increased day length, which causes the photoreceptors to stimulate longer because there's more light, photoreceptors, they detect light longer, which causes the brain to have neural and hormonal changes, all that cause breeding in the spring. But why does this happen? Well, the ultimate cause is because something like the water will get warm. H2O gets warm. That's an ultimate cause. It's a why. Um, and this is going to cause then the abundance of food. There's going to be an abundant uh, amount of food all of which are going to um, ultimately, I would say, cause the following. Let me rewrite that. Abundant food. So these are, I would consider, two side notes to the ultimate causes. The ultimate, ultimate cause is the following. It's always about the offspring in animal behavior. What is going to be the best thing that will aid in the survival and reproduction, not only of myself, but of those that will come after me? of my offspring. The question here is why do they breed in spring? The result of breeding, of course, is the young, is offspring. And this is all going to be for the growth and survival of young. Why do they grow and survive um, in the spring better than others? Because the water's warm, because there's an abundant food source, and all of this is going to help our young bluegill sunfish survive and grow at a better rate. This is why we breed in spring. And how we breed in spring is because of the increased day length. It's because of the photoreceptors. It's because of the neural and hormonal changes. This is a physiological change, much like this. How does the organism respond? The whole organism responds physiologically. A physiological change, a physical um, mechanism is the neural and hormonal changes, all of which are going to be in a response to the warm water, the abundant food, which allows the young to grow up nice and strong.